you know about the THS. Um, um, so, of course, um, we are in the traditional lands of the Aakam people, the Sonoran Desert people, and several other uh, diverse groups of people. Um, Timamak Hill, where I work, is the Aakam, known in Aakam as Chamamak Duag, which means Horn Lizard Mountain. And across the valley is Babadak Duag, or Toad Sitting Mountain, also known as the Catalinas. Um, but this is the west side of Push Peak. And I don't know if you can see um, the outline of a giant sitting toad. Push Peak is the tip of the snout. And then there's two rock formations, just on one on each side that represent the eyes. And I can just briefly draw that. Whoa. That's amazing. Let's see. Right. So here's a paratoid gland. It's another paratoid gland. <laughs> and um, there's little dimples to the back. Here's a leg. And there you have it. The Sonoran Desert Toad. <clears throat> That's wonderful. So this is our protagonist, Encilius alvarius. It's the largest amphibian in the Southwest. It's, a, it's the largest amphibian in the United States. And um, what makes it a toad is this gland here. And um, toads are basically more terrestrial frogs. Um, the males are distinguished by these blackened um, digits during mating season. And it's basically the amphibian version of a saguaro. Uh, it's, an, it's endemic to the Sonoran Desert. It's found nowhere else. Here's a map. Uh, this, is, uh, ye this yellow here represents the Sonoran Desert. Um, And it, it has various subdivisions um, and the range of the toad basically coincides with, with the Sonoran Desert. Um, it's also known as Colorado River Toad. It was collected by Arthur Schott uh, on the banks of the Colorado River at Fort Yuma. I think it's the, was the California side. Um, and habitat alteration basically has removed that animal from when it, where it was first collected for science. Um, the type specimen, the, the, the one specimen that was collected that represents the entire species is in Washington DC under number 2572. We know surprisingly very little about the species. Um, we know from unpublished reports that they can live between 15 to 20 years. And when they're not associated with human dwellings or, or uh, spaces, they like to hide out in kangaroo rat burrow complexes. Here's one um, that my friend photographed. He was actually studying mud turtles. Oops, excuse me. So he was studying mud turtles um, and trying to figure out where they laid their eggs. And he found the egg of a mud turtle in here. Um, and he's also found this toad guarding it like a, like a troll. Um, but this is what they sound like. This is a mating call. Um, and they, of course, are, are um, laying dormant underground. They need, they, they have porous skin, which they need to keep moist to stay alive. Um, and so they, live, they wrap themselves in a cocoon of skin underground for nine months out of the year. 
And then the, the noise, the, the literally the sound of thunder and water hitting the ground uh, causes these animals to come up to the surface. And they have this short window of time during the monsoon season to reproduce, eat, and then get back underground before things dry up. Um, and so just like birds, each species has a different call to avoid hybridization or confusion. Um, and so, but still it's dark. And if another male, if a male grabs another male, they have a release call. It sounds like a chicken pluck. So um, the Snar Desert Toad genus is Encilius, and Encilius is a, uh, otherwise a group of very tropical toads found in Mexico and, and the Sierra Madre. So it's very unusual. It's, it's sort of like um, the oddball, the black sheep of this otherwise tropical family of toads. And indeed, that's what characterizes the Sonoran Desert is an abundance of species that either evolved from tropical ancestors or are tropical themselves. Um, and they require more permanent, deeper bodies of water to reproduce because they have a, a long metamorphosis. Um, and to me, this speaks to those tropical origins. Um, they can lay well over 3000 eggs. And ever since there's been electric lights in the desert, there have been toads um, attracted to those lights uh, for the insects. Um, they eat anything that will move in front of them, and they actually use their eyeballs to swallow their food. So they'll grab some, they'll grab something with their tongue, it'll come into the mouth, and you'll notice that their eyes drop down into their sockets to help push the food down. But they eat. Um, centipedes, beetles with really caustic uh, chemicals in them, uh, other smaller toads. They're just, they don't, their visual acuity is based on movement essentially. Um, but they do have their predators. Um, raccoons, <coughs> I've been known to flip the toads on their backs to avoid all those toxic glands. Um, this is an indigo snake eating one. A here's a badger running off with one. But um, so amphibians in general and, spe and more specifically toads, they produce toxins through their skin. And this is basically very sophisticated sweat. Um, desert amphibians um, and especially toads uh, in general had to figure out how to balance their uh, water, their uh, body water for a new existence on land. And so just like you and I that depend on the balance of sodium and potassium across our cell walls, our membranes, um, toads had to really find a sophisticated way of of maintaining that. Um, and so their sweat, so to speak, became a way of keeping water uh, in and, um, and also became the, one of their most, their most successful defense mechanisms. And one of the, one of the, the chemicals, uh, most active one in toads is bufotenin. Um, it's called bufotenin because it was found in toads. But it turns out that we have bufotenin. Plants have bufotenin. Bufotenin is a widespread um, chemical. And it's actually found in higher levels uh, in people who have schizophrenia and autism. Um, there are also these things called cardiac glycosides, uh, which um, can relax heart muscles sometimes permanently. And so ingesting these secretions orally as this mural is suggesting is actually quite dangerous. And it's why dogs and cats can die if they ingest too much of this. Um, usually uh, it's good to just wash the, their mouths out with running water and call a vet. 
um, usually they'll, they're just fine unless they ingest a, a large quantity of it. But um, where things get interesting is that the Sonoran Desert Toad is the only toad and the only animal on earth that produces 5-MeO DMT from the paratoid glands, this big, that big lump behind the eye. And we don't know why. Um, so whereas all, all the other toads produce bufotenin and cardiac glycosides from uh, the, those large glands and the rest of its skin, the Sonoran Desert Toad is the only toad and the only animal that produces 5-MeO-DMT from the paratoid glands, and it's nearly pure. Um, Sounds like they're happy toads to me. I don't speak toad, but perhaps. Um, so there's nothing in the diet of this animal uh, that is any different from other toads. Um, it's, uh, these are just questions that might be, might possibly hold the answer, but we really don't know. Um, and how did we find this out? Well, it came out of a mistake. In 1981, um, there's these three paragraphs in Omni Magazine. And essentially, um, this guy named Alan Maurer uh, interviewed uh, an archeologist. This archeologist found over 10,000 headless toad remains in a Cherokee uh, archeological site. And because the archeologist knew that, buf that toads contain bufotenin, which is a mild psychedelic, that's why I forgot to mention, um, thought that these, these Cherokees must have been using the toads for psychedelic purposes. But it turns out much later on that the toads were uh, used for food. Um, bufotenin is not active orally, so you can't take it up. It's, it's a mild psychoactive, but it's not orally active through the mucous membranes. And it's not heat stable. So there simply wasn't technology um, that was able to extract the bufotenin from these toads. And these are not Sonoran Desert toads. The Sonoran Desert toads are in the Sonoran Desert. They're not in the Cherokee territory. So what I'm saying is that this archeologist made a very careless assumption and someone read this um, and thinking that there was some psychoactivity in toads, toad skin chemistry. And he went to this book on the evolution of the genus Bufo and there's a whole chapter in there on the chemistry of toad skin. And it turns out that the people who wrote that chapter built their careers on understanding the chemistry of amphibian skin. Well, he read this chapter and there's a reference to these two notes on the right, uh, which explicitly identify the Sonoran Desert Toad as having 5-methoxy-dimethyltryptamine, yeah, uh, 5-MeO-DMT. Now this was before the internet. This was in the in the eighties or late seventies, um, and so this person basically went through the stacks at the library and read these very technical articles, and realizing that five meo DMT is psychoactive and is uh, heat stable, decided that he would drive to Arizona from Denton, Texas, and find a Sonoran Desert Toad, squeeze out the, the paratoid glands onto his windshield, and after they had dried, smoked it and had an incredibly transcendental experience. And he wrote this pamphlet in 1984. And this was an underground fringe activity um, until 
these very famous doctors um, were the first to report their experiences, personal experiences with the with this in uh, two articles in, in academic journals. And in here, they go on to speculate that this must have been uh, indigenous practice, that this must have been invented or discovered by indigenous people, when in fact it wasn't. There's no evidence for it. It was, it was found by a guy named um, Ken Nelson in Denton, Texas. So without any evidence, um, these authors say this must have been something that indigenous people did. And in fact, you know, there's lots of evidence that would is very suggestive that it could that that could have been the possibility. We have these incense burner, uh, incense burning vessels in the shapes of toads. Toads figure in Mesoamerican and uh, pre-Hispanic cultures. But there's just no evidence that the Sonoran Desert toad was ever traded or used, or any toads were used in any psychedelic manner. These are um, clay vessels from, I think, either Argentina or Peru, or excuse me, Argentina or Chile, which mimic the local species of toads and frogs. Um, we have combo, which is um, the scraped skin secretions of a tree frog, which are not psychedelic, but are burned into the skin in order to facilitate uh, hunting. It, after a severe purge, your, your heart, your blood pressure goes up and your senses are heightened which aid in uh, hunting of game in the forest, sight and, and taste and feeling and such are, all your, your senses are heightened as a side effect of, of having this burned into your skin. Um, but it has no psychedelic properties. Um, the Seri people in the Sonoran Desert always viewed toads as toxic and avoided uh, uh, eating them, but um, with this new wave of, of psychedelic demand on the toad, um, there's been a wave of charlatans and uh, pseudo shamans that are charging lots of money to smoke the secretions of the Sonoran Desert toad. And it's having, uh, it's going to have really bad repercussions for toads as well as people because um, people have died from this. This is an open letter to two practitioners for malpractice. Um, and the reason people do it is not just recreational. Smoking 5-MeO-DMT, whether it's from a toad or, or from any other source, um, can remove one's addiction to um, drugs it can treat uh, treatment resistant depression. It can treat PTSD. But if these, if the substance isn't properly or responsibly administered, uh, it can, it can do just as much damage as, as the things it's meant to, to eliminate. Um, so what we know is that these toads are collected in large quantities, and they're their glands are expressed and collected. Uh, there's a number of problems with this. Uh, this is a great way to spread disease. Uh, uh, the amphibian disease, chytridge fungus. These animals are stressed, they're terrified, and they're often not returned to where they were found, which means that they're then lost and they have a very low survival rate uh, if they're lost. So it's just a number, a whole number of things which are uh, incompatible with the idea of sustainably sourced 5-MeO-DMT from Sonoran Desert Toads. This is all very sorted. Everyone is, is basically in it for money um, with the guys, with the poster child of the treatment of substance abuse and such. 
this land here has been severely abused and over uh, stimulated and over harvested. Um, they do, they generally don't make good pets, although there's a person in British Columbia and a person in Hungary who's are, they're breeding these animals, uh, ostensibly to relieve the demand for wild toads, to, to relieve the demand and the trafficking of wild toads. <clears throat> There's an annual conference dedicated to this animal. Um, Mike Tyson and uh, the New York Post and Town and Country are reporting on this phenomenon, making the toad more and more popular. Uh, Terra Incognita is a psychedelics organization that attempted to sort of understand early on the uh, toad populations, but really didn't produce any sort of science whatsoever. Um, they tried to sell something, they tried to sell the idea of fair trade toad, which again, doesn't exist. Um, and so basically the International Union for the Conservation of Nature lists this species as a species of least concern because there's no data available on it. In other words, people assumed that there there were or is probably still is large, there's probably still are large um, quantities of toads on the landscape. Um, and so they focus on things that are near extinction. And when they turn around, the things that they thought were abundant are starting to show signs of, of distress. And usually it's too late. So this is what we call a mortality sink or a vacuum in which people harvest X amount of toads a, year, a season, and the surrounding toad populations fill in that vacuum and lead to a perception of abundance. <clears throat> but you have to think of the toad populations or local toad populations as a house of cards. You can get away each year by removing X amount of animals until the entire populations collapse. So really we're working against time because uh, we need a baseline. We we need a, a we need a, a we need data from populations before the poaching and trafficking of these animals really ticked up, uh, in order to define uh, the the um, intensity of the problem. So, climate change and drought really affects our ability to measure what a healthy population is because they're based on uh, the availability of healthy rain cycles. <clears throat> Breeding these animals in captivity is just another opportunity for an amphibian disease outbreak. And it just ecologically just doesn't work. Um, The substance is easily synthesized. Um, we reissued the pamphlet and uh, appended a, a laboratory synthesis of 5-MeO DMT. <clears throat> There's lots of money around pro uh, pro uh, making proprietary um, versions of 5-MeO DMT. <clears throat> and this company, uh, is, is actually cultured toad cells from the paratoid gland that actually produce 5-MeO-DMT for people who insist that it must come from the toad, even though there's no basis for um, the suggestion that there's something different about 5-MeO-DMT coming from the toads. It's the same molecule, whether it comes from a toad or a laboratory, does the same, works, behaves the same way on your, on your, um, nervous system and your brain. Um, and so all of this on top of the, all the challenges that, that the Sonoran Desert already faces, which is <clears throat> drought, climate change, um, the uh, human growth and, and uh, barriers faced by, imposed by those yeah. things. Um, and so um, some facts for you to just recap with, it's a unique long-lived species found nowhere else. Uh, it's the only animal that produces 5-MeO-DMT that we know of. Its ancient use as a hallucinogen is speculative.
speculative and uh, inconclusive. At, we don't know why they produce 5-MeO-DMT. Um, we need more research. We need to encourage people to use alternative sources of the drug and uh, begin to monitor and enforce protection, monitor poaching and enforce protections, which are very difficult. It's very difficult to monitor an illegal activity. So what we have to do is measure the impacts of, of other things like climate change and population health um, uh, besides the, the poaching uh, in order to, to be able to say that poaching can't possibly be helping the species. So we've developed the conservation campaign uh, and we've raised money um, through the sale of merchandise um, to uh, fund the Sonoran Desert Toad Fund, um, which we have at the Tucson Herp Society and are currently um, better poising ourselves to collect better data. Uh, we only have about half a season worth of data from last season. And um, uh, we, we at lead, need at least three seasons, preferably more than five, to get an idea of the po uh, population status of these animals. And even then, it could, it could, we could be seeing that, that populations are fine over, over a huge range. Most, most of the Sonoran Desert, there are probably still lots of toads. But um, we need to continue monitoring over a long-term project to look at um, whether toads are actually being, will begin to decrease in areas where people are collecting them. So it's important that we, we sample these animals across their entire range in order to say, well, at these areas, perhaps where they're being trafficked, their populations are trending downward perhaps, or there could be a higher incidence of disease. So we're not just looking at whether the animal is uh, endangered across its entire range, but we really wanna be able to say that trafficking these animals is detrimental. Um, is, it is it currently against the law right now for people no. to do this? So well, it's, that's, a, that's a tricky question because in Arizona with a fishing license, you can collect up to 10 Sonoran Desert toads, whether for pets or for whatever. Um, you can collect up to 10 per year with a fishing license. However, if you're suspected of trafficking these animals or collecting them for the 5-MeO-DMT, then that becomes a federal offense because it's a schedule it's a schedule one narcotic. So it all comes down to the interpretation of the law. Um, but um, in, in Cal those news articles will often cite, well, it's been extirpated from California and is an endangered species in New Mexico. Um, but that's also a mixed, that, that, that's a, that's a bit confusing. One, those are the edges of the range where their populations were lower anyways. The populations in California were more abundant, but they died out because of uh, uh, habitat change and extraction of water. And then in New Mexico, they're at that very edge of the Sonoran Desert where they're not, uh, as a, they're not abundant. And that's not to say that it's not important to protect those animals, but there's a perception that they're rare, but it's because they're at the edge of their range. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to do with poaching or, or habitat destruction necessarily. Um, you know, the other problem we have is that the, the, the bureaucracies and the administration, the, the, the rubrics that we, that we implement to protect species uh, often are, can be just as problematic. The, for example, um, the, I, the IUCN has 
gives this species its lowest priority because it lacks data. Well, <clears throat> we probably that's we probably want to protect things that lack data rather than uh, deprioritize them. But um, you know, in order to get any sort of listing above that within the IUCN or the Endangered Species Act, which is a fed federal, US federal thing, or even in Mexico's endangered species list, you have to run through a very rigorous set of rubrics um, that, that in order to make recommendations um, beyond the question of the doubt that this animal should be protected. And that can, the amount of time that that takes can, can be impeding. Um, let's say five years passes and we get, we get data and we're able to make a qualified recommendation to Mexico's government. Um, uh, by that time, things could, could be far worse. And the recommendations that we recommended might need altering, <laughs> but, but then more, more time to, to support those, those edits. So um, at this point, it's really public education that's going to um, be our most potent um, tool in getting people to leave these toads alone. Um, and you can tell people what to do all day, but they're still gonna do whatever they wanna do. Uh, uh, the trick lies in really con convincing people that uh, it's un completely unnecessary to uh, take this from the toads or, or use these toads for this purpose. Um, but yeah, um, that's my talk. Oh, that's Well, that's wonderful and awful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's a remarkable story. Yeah. yeah. It's um, it's a it's a weird story of how it happened. Um, you know, one one uh, scientist misstatement uh, led somebody to to discover something, which um, no one knew about. Uh, until he did it. And it's, it's like, to me, so hip, hypocritical that some people are seeking enlightenment mm -hmm. at the, uh, you know, against the, uh, the toad. I mean, right, it, it, yeah, it's pretty ironic. Yeah. Well, anyway, this is, um, so I, I had um, a link to, do you have a website or is it just through the Herb Society to get just, information? Um, just through the Herb Society. I mean, I can type my email address if people want to ask me. Okay, questions. that'd be great. Because I think, yeah, like you said, and, and you know, I read the um, uh, How to Change Your Mind. Mm -hmm. And that too, uh, he, he was, you know, he's a well-known um, author. And I, I think he, didn't he kind of apologize for it? I don't know. I, I, I haven't I haven't read the book and I heard that there's a Netflix special now on oh. it. Uh, I remember I was able to get mutual friends of ours to eat to to email him and say you just can't uh, please be careful about how you portray this. Yeah. Uh, and in his book he really apparently didn't had a really terrible experience. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, but ironically, again, that doesn't really deter people from, from doing it. Um, the, the pro television program that I worked on that, uh, unfortunately launched this toad into popularity, uh, despite my best efforts, um, you know, the opening sequence to that show uh, depicts it has people rolling on the ground and 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 really having what appears to be an unpleasant time, and the look of of terror on the host's face, um, but uh, people still wanted to do it. So um, 
it's um it's a pandora's box you're 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 playing with people's imaginations and desire to escape the mundane or escape real problems like like drug addiction that's right ptsd well, but, they're doing that with psilocybin now, but I remember seeing, was that Hamilton? What, what was the name yeah, of it? Yeah. yeah, I remember seeing that and and people were uh, really having, looked like having a, a really bad trip. I don't know why. Yeah. You know, um, psilocybin is actually far more efficacious in treating PTSD and treatment and resistant depression. And um, they looked at, um, getting off of cigarettes. <clears throat> um, you know, the nature of 5-MeO-DMT is extreme. You, you have a, what could best be described maybe as a near-death experience. Mm. And you have to ask yourself if that's really what you need. I mean, it, perhaps if you're at, the, at rock bottom, uh, you, you do need something like that, but um, if you're trying to quit smoking or uh, have PTSD or something, um, there are more effective psychedelic tools uh, with more people who are equipped uh, and experienced with, with administering those, those substances uh, than 5-MeO-DMT. And, 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 and destroying more habitats. Yeah, and destroying habitats. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's fascinating. Um, any questions? Any have any anybody have questions? I remember seeing a news report, and I think it was out of Phoenix, and it was a, a film clip of people with a big burlap bag mm -hmm. full of you know toads, and the newscaster said, "And look, those people are taking toads. I wonder why they're doing that." <laughs> sort of like, well. Public education would be <laughs> value. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, I think this has been a wonderful discussion, Robert. I'm, I'm really happy that you could come and uh, hope you're feeling better. I hope I didn't pull you out of no, that's fine. recovery <laughs> to talk about. But you love the, the subject, so. I love the subject um, and uh, it helps uh, keep me uh, entertained in my COVID quarantine. <laughs> Yeah, you can watch all the little lizards running around. Well, if there are any other questions, um, we'll say good night and thank you again. It's so good to see you. I haven't, like I said, I haven't seen you in a while, but uh, it's good to see you. And to see thanks you. for having me. It's nice to meet you all. I hope thank you all you. something. Very interesting subject. Thanks. <laughs> bye bye. bye. Good night.